It's been a while since I produced a YouTube video and I just got back from Ontario where I taught my 25th permaculture design course and it was incredible for lots of reasons and so I wanted to talk a little bit about what was so incredible about it and specifically some of the the key learnings that I gained um, as a response to teaching the course. So I had 16 incredible students. If you're watching this, guys, I just wanted to say thanks again for um, opening up your province to me and, and uh, taking the PDC on. Uh, it's a tough course. It's full of content. Uh, it's an emotional course. Um, and I'm really excited to see what you guys do with all that information. I've already heard from a bunch of you, and I, I always love hearing from, from past students. Ontario is a really neat place. It's um, kind of the northernmost portion of the Carolinian forest, which is an incredible ecosystem. Um, and if you've never heard about it, you should check it out. It's got one of the most biodiverse um, ecosystems on the planet, actually, especially in North America. And one of the characteristics of the Carolinian forest is, is all the hardwoods that grow there, which is quite different than where I'm from, which is mostly softwoods. So hardwoods are things like oak, beech, um, mulberry, maple, all those kind of deciduous trees that have hard woods. Um, and the thing with hardwoods is that most of them produce uh, nuts or fruits. Um, and so, super interesting place. The other thing about Ontario is the amount of rain that it gets. I mean, this year was a very wet year for, for Ontario, but um, the parts that I visited in the last 12 months all get between 800 millimeters and a meter of rain. So that's between you know two and three feet of rain per year. So lots and lots of rain. And um, what's really interesting about that is that in my ecosystem, you know, we get about a foot of rain if we're lucky in a year. This year we got almost nothing. So um, when Ontario was getting record rains this year, you know, Western Canada was basically in a drought. Um, and then in Alberta, our ecosystem focuses a lot around irrigation. So we have irrigation districts and we try and develop water opportunities um, so that we can grow things like corn, soy, not so much soy out here, but for sure corn in the southern part of the province. There would be some soy down there, um, canola, wheat. And then where you can't get irrigation, our farmland generally focuses around being what we call dryland farming. And so you plant what you can plant and you harvest whatever grows. And what, if it doesn't grow, then you don't harvest it. or you just don't get a very good harvest. Whereas in Ontario, it's the exact opposite. They have what are called uh, drainage districts. And so um, almost every field in Ontario that's growing conventional crops, corn, soy, some wheat, some canola, but mostly corn and soy, um, all have weeping tile underneath it. And they call it tile. They call them tile districts and drainage districts. So essentially what's going on is they're installing pipe underneath the fields, um, just like the stuff behind me, to essentially lower the groundwater table. And they're doing this to try and allow conventional crops that don't like wet feet, like corn and soy, to grow. And to me this is completely insane. So I visited several farms while I was out there and what was really interesting about these farms is they all had some, some you know, pristine bushland on it. And um, outside of the bushland was corn and soy on these fields that were being drained into ditches or drainage ditches. Um, and then in the pristine forest, they had all these incredible nut forests. Um, and the nuts are just sitting on the ground. They're not being used. It's like this perennial food crop that the people of Ontario have decided don't have any value or aren't worth harvesting. Um, and instead, they've just moved to monoculture crops that they can harvest with their combines, um, either turn into silage for um, the purpose of dairy. And dairy really shouldn't be eating corn silage anyways. I mean, it's possible, but why not just put them back on pasture? Um, and so I found it really sad that this incredibly biodiverse, productive ecosystem was being bled to death. Um, and while I was there, you know, there's all this stuff going on in the news right now about going to Mars. There was somebody that told me a story out there talking about how there's, there's conversations happening in parts of Ontario right now where they're talking about banning um, the self-production of corn. So corn in your own home garden because they're scared that the corn in your garden might 
spawn a disease that would spread to industrial corn. And at the end of my trip, I couldn't help but thinking that maybe Interstellar is not a Hollywood movie, but it was actually a documentary. I mean, we're going to space, technology is increasing dramatically right now. Um, we're growing more and more corn and soy. We're force functioning ecosystems to grow crops that are less productive than the ones that grow there on their own, um, AKA hardwood mast crops like nuts and um, acorns. And, uh, and yet we're, you know, we're all sick. Um, we're getting sick because the food that we're growing is not nutritionally dense. And so I, uh, I couldn't help but thinking that maybe that movie was a bit of a documentary. So if you're in Ontario and you deeply love that province, I think one of the best things that you can do is start finding innovative ways to use those mass crops. Um, some of the best systems in the world relied entirely on the perennial production of nuts. And so it's not just nuts that you get as a yield, you get the, the ecological services of the trees, you can stop draining the field, so you start replenishing the groundwater reservoir. Um, you know, water is the driving force. Water and sun are the driving forces of all um, plant pathways on the, on the planet. And it's plants that make Earth different from Mars. So instead of trying to grow inferior crops that are less productive, we should be trying to return the Carolinian forest back to Ontario. Um, and finding innovative ways to go and harvest those products. And so you may be thinking, well, how are we going to harvest nuts without combines? Well, you're not. You're going to use pigs or you can use other livestock that can go out and, and forage for those nuts. And then you're going to value add your pork. Um, this ties really nicely into another uh, discovery that I made recently, which is um, a discovery about vitamin D. And um, most of us that are not kind of familiar with the importance of eating naturally raised animals and naturally raised food and all that stuff, um, and, and you may not even realize this at all, that, but, but like raising your animals outside, the reason it's important not to eat animals that are raised inside of a barn is that one of the most important sources of vitamin D in our ecosystem actually comes from the animal proteins that we consume that are raised outside that are able to accumulate vitamin D through the interaction of solar radiation on their skin. Um, and so not only would we end up returning function back to the forest, which are far more productive than the annual crops, but we'd also deal with this looming vitamin D pandemic, um, the shortage of vitamin D that we have living in the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, it's interesting that the Inuit have lived in the northern, northernest part of the planet for thousands of years. And nobody talks or talked about when they were eating traditional diets about vitamin D deficiency up there. And that's because they were eating uh, largely animal based diets um, where the animals were allowed to live outside all year round and accumulate vitamin D. So we don't need combines and we don't need tractors, at least not for most of our farmland, at least out in Ontario. Um, you can move back to perennial uh, systems specifically just copy the Carolinian forest that knows exactly what to do and then you can essentially move back to a pig driven agriculture growing outdoor pigs that are raised off mast crops um, and in doing so you'll sequester carbon you'll have vitamin D uh, like meat that's full of vitamin D so it's nutrient dense um, you will change the whole climate of that whole peninsula in Ontario and in addition to all of that you can make good money selling pork that is completely unique because it's being grown outside. I see the opportunity in Ontario as un unsurpassed. Um, there is so much space for improvement there. You guys have got the water, you've got the sun, you've got the heat and you've got the biodiversity. It's just wet ready to explode. So if you're getting this and you live in Ontario, um, I, I want to share one last little resource with you guys because it's basically the design manual for your ecosystem. So this book is basically a design manual for your ecosystem. It's called uh, Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith. And the subtitle is there, A Permanent Agriculture. And what I love about this book, it's really easy to read. Um, every chapter is uh, delineated by um, different types of trees. 
but it's written in a way that um, a farmer could read and really get excited about. So every chapter kind of breaks out different um, trees and then calls it with essentially a metaphorical name. So instead of calling the honey locust the honey locust, they call it the stock food tree. So essentially they're implying that it's great for stock food. Um, or the real sugar tree, which is referring to maple. Um, or a summer pasture tree for swine and poultry, which is actually the mulberry. Um, or the persimmon, which is a pasture tree for the beasts and kingly fruit for man. Um, or a corn tree, which is the chestnut. Um, or another corn tree, which is the oak as a forage crop. So every chapter is basically talking about a different type of tree that would typically grow, most of them are going to grow in the Carolinian forest in Ontario, um, and can be used to feed any number of different types of livestock, as well as humans too. Like these, these nuts and acorns don't just have to go to the production of, um, of livestock on your farm. Thanks so much for listening. If you've never heard of our permaculture design courses, you can check them out at vergepermaculture.ca. If you're new to this channel and you find this information interesting, make sure you hit the subscribe button below and hit the like because it really helps our videos track better so that more people can see them. Thanks. Have a great day, guys.